Hey folks, I do hope that you're all having a great day today. This is going to be a discussion about router bits, specifically flush trim bits, not a deep dive, all kinds of crazy info. Just, just want to bring up some things that you may not have considered. So that way, when you go to make your next flush trim router bit purchase, at least you have a little bit better understanding uh, if you don't already know all this stuff. So uh, I've got five things on my list to talk about. I've got six bits right here in front of me. You kind of can't see them the best, so I'll show a different image with a nice, clean, crisp, white background. Ooh, real nice. You can see everything, right? So I'm going to talk about upcut versus downcut, bit diameter, router speed, router size, and a little section I call worth considering. So first up, upcut versus downcut. How do you know which one's upcut versus downcut? When I first got into woodworking, I didn't care about the specifics and I'd keep the bits in their packages so I could determine what it was. And it was always confusing because it's opposite in a router table than it is in a handheld router as far as the cut direction. Well, which one is, which one's more appropriate? Well, you always determine up cut versus down cut, holding the bit in the same orientation that it would be seen in a handheld router. Okay. So in this orientation, shank up, working end down, business end down. Spin it around, and in this case, I can spin this and determine that the, uh, the cutting edge will force, force the waste down. That means this is a down cut router bit. This one over here, you can't see it from this distance, but it's the opposite. It's going to push the fibers up. However, when you put these in a router table, it completely flips everything around. It's completely opposite. So in a router table, this orientation, it's going to push the fibers up, but it's still a down cut bit. So you always have to take that into consideration. You always have to, uh, to figure out what it is in the handheld router orientation. Same thing with uh, cut direction on a handheld router versus a router table. If I'm approaching a workpiece with a handheld router to do some type of edge treatment, I work from left to right. That's the way you always do it. Otherwise, it's a climb cut. And it's the opposite at a router table. You always approach the router table from the right and work your way to the left. So everything flips when you flip the, the, the orientation of the router. Router, router table. Everything flips. So do you want an up cut or a down cut bit? Um, this, all of these notes, all this info is in collaboration with my friends over at Bits and Bits and they brought up a couple points that I had not considered. And one is a super gnarly wood grain. So up cut for the router table. Using the down cut on the router table with a gnarlier wood grain can push the workpiece up off the table if you're not expecting that. And I have experienced that before, but I never really took into consideration uh, the geometry of the bit causing that. So uh, if you have, let's just say, uh, a, a down cut, which is actually pushing material up in a router table, and you're using the template like this on top of a workpiece, and you're running, running through some super gnarly stuff, it can sometimes grab the bit and want to push it up. Well, if, if you're flush trimming and you push this up, you are no longer flat anymore. Even if it's just a little bit, you're no longer flat anymore. And if that edge of your workpiece touches the router bit, you've gouged out a big section or a small section, doesn't matter. You've gouged out a little piece of your material with a flush trim bit that you never even thought was possible because it just pushed the material up. I've had that happen bit to me before. So at a router table, you want an up cut bit because it's actually pulling the fibers down. Remember, opposite at a router table. Caveat, down cut for pushing against a template for reduced tear out. Let's just say you have some, you know, some poplar or something that's not crazy wood, wood grain, gnarly, all that stuff, whatever. In that case, I would opt for um, a down cut, so I'm actually pushing the fibers up, because this is going to be on top of my workpiece. And if it's on top of my workpiece, the bearing is referencing off of this template, and I want to push the fibers up so that all of those cuts are being supported by this template. It's kind of like a zero clearance sensor on your table saw. It reduces tear out. Same thing here. You want it to be going in this direction. So um, that's something to consider as far as what type of wood you use may influence what type of geometry on the bit to purchase. Bit diameter. Avoid an enveloped cut where the bit is surrounded on three sides by wood as opposed to rough cutting close to the line and trimming off 1 16th of an inch or so. So let's just say you're using this template to, um, to batch out a bunch of parts, right? So what I would do is you put this on your material that you're going to 
finish, your finished material, and you trace around the template so you know where to use a bandsaw or jigsaw to remove the majority of the waste. Then you secure this to your workpiece and then flush trim all the way around it. If you leave a half an inch of material all the way around your profile and then try and flush trim it with a quarter inch diameter bit, that's gonna be a lot of unnecessary stress on this little bit. Um, you're, you're going to increase the opportunity for bit breakage because a quarter inch bit is, is way more brittle than the same material in a half inch shank, right? So the smaller the bit, obviously the more brittle it is, the more opportunity you have to actually break it, especially on a, an aggressive cut like an enveloped cut. I try, if at all possible, to never, ever, ever do an enveloped cut. If you're going to envelope the bit, we recommend a single direction bit as opposed to the compression, which can get a little jumpy when it's buried. The single direction is pulling the chips out quickly and not letting them pack into the cut, uh, into the cut pocket like a compression would. So I'm not sure if I mentioned it already, but um, I spoke with my friends at Bits and Bits Company to, to get some ideas for this video and put together this outline. So this is the information here is a collaboration between me and bits and bits. The last part of bit diameter is interior corners may require a smaller diameter bit. So there's different performances with the, the cutting geometry, but size is still a limiting factor for some things. For example, this particular one right here, this template that I keep referencing, has quarter inch radius little interior corners where some slats go. This is for a chair, actually. And that quarter inch radius cannot be reached with a 7 eighths of an inch diameter bit. It just physically won't meet that. So for this situation, it's obvious that you need a smaller bit. Uh, 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 th these bits right here are 7 eighths, half, 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 quarter and quarter as far as diameter goes. So it, you, you kind of have situations where you do need to have a smaller diameter bit to get into those little small spots, but a quarter inch diameter bit, if at all possible for me going forward, will never be the, the default go-to flush trim bit. I'll only use a quarter inch bit if I need to get into a certain specific um, certain specific interior corner as far as the uh, space available is concerned. Future J jumping in, as I'm recording the B-roll footage for this video, I realized that I failed to take into consideration the cutting length. So how much material do you need to flush trim? Well, these three spirals are all three half inch shank spirals. And you can see the effective cutting length is different on all of these. This is a up, I'm sorry, this is a down cut spiral, up cut spiral, and then a compression. This one has the least amount of effective cutting length. They all, if you look at all these, they all kind of start at the same height in this orientation, but the length of the cutting edge is the least on this one, a little bit longer on this one, and a little bit longer on this one. I don't know the exact values, maybe, maybe a inch, inch and a half, two inches, something like that. But take that into consideration when you go shopping for a flush trim bit because the length can determine how much material you can actually cut as well. Router speed is next. Now, before I get into the router speed, I've mentioned this several times in the past. Don't run your routers wide open, if at all possible. Start on the low end of the RPM scale and work your way up to what you feel is an optimal cut because well, I'll just, I'll just read this real quick. Router speed. Router speed is another issue that comes up, especially in the quarter inch diameter bits. Most guys install a bit and turn it up to full speed, but chip load applies to all spiral bits, regardless of CNC or routerless or, or router use. Chip load is the appropriate size chip that should be created while you're cutting. If you make a massive chip, you're, you're cutting way too aggressively and you could potentially damage the bit or something crazy could happen. If you're making a too small of a chip or dust, you're getting rubbing and not cutting. Rubbing causes friction, friction causes heat. Heat buildup dulls the life of your router bit and burns your material. So there's a sweet spot. It's called chip load. There's calculations on there for you know situations where you can really control the RPM and, and feed speed like a CNC machine. Uh, on a handheld router situation, you can control the RPM, but it's up to you to determine the feed speed, and that's highly irregular based upon human movement. So uh, where was I at with that? That's chip load. You still have to maintain a good chip load. Turning the speed up to 27,000 plus RPM can make the bit erratic as well as cause it to dull quicker because it's cutting dust and overheating, rubbing versus cutting. 18,000 or 16,000 to 18,000 is the recommended speed for all spirals. I'll go beyond that recommendation of speed and say start low, work your way up to find the best results. That's especially true 
on larger diameter edge profiling stuff where you have like a, you know, a one inch or two, one and a half inch in diameter chamfer bit or a round over bit, start slow with the RPM, work your way up. You won't get near as much burning. You'll get much better results. Router size. Router size is also important. A solid carbide bit is more brittle than a standard steel shank tool. We have guys sticking a quarter inch bit into a three horsepower router and over torquing and snapping the bit after it hits a dense pocket of wood or the user moves the router too fast. The thinner quarter inch work with quarter inch bits work really well on the smaller trim routers, but a larger router will do much better with a half inch diameter bit. I have uh, Porter Cable three, three and a half horsepower, I forget the exact size, but the big Porter Cable motor, motors that are um, kind of known to be in router tables. I have two router tables here in the shop. Both of them have that larger diameter, uh, um, larger powered motor. And in those, I always keep either a half inch or this seven eighths of an inch for flush trimming. I almost never put a quarter inch shank into a router table because the motors they can handle much more and I know from past experience that even just stepping up to a half inch shank the the stability of the bit the, it's it's much much stronger stability is not the right word the deflection much less deflection so as you're cutting the bit is going to deflect a little bit one way or the other with the stresses applied uh, laterally against the bit as you're actually using it quarter inch or half inch diameter will not flex nearly as much even if it, I don't even know if it's noticeable uh, than a quarter inch bit, which can be noticeable at times. Two things worth considering. First, compression isn't necessarily the ultimate bit for trimming. It may produce the most crisp edges, but most of the time you're going to round over a trim for the edges anyways. So a little fuzz doesn't really matter in the long run. So if I was in the market for a new flush trim router bit, I probably wouldn't pick a compression bit until I analyzed how I would use it and just looked at the geometry, looked at the exact situation and, and made a determine, determination that yes, having the spirals in both directions would be beneficial. If you can't find one of those situations, probably you probably shouldn't spend the extra money for a compression spiral flush trim bit. Compression spirals by themselves without a bearing, without the flush trim aspect, are phenomenal for situations like CNC use where you want to have a crisp top surface and a really crisp bottom surface as you cut your way all the way through the work surface. On a flush trim situation, probably not the most useful feature. The second thing worth considering is the 7 8 of an inch bit that I have has an integrated depth stop is what I'm calling it. I'm not exactly sure if it's called a depth stop, but that's what I'm calling it. You can't take a massive bite. The bit just won't allow it. So I'll put a closer image of this specific bit on the screen. This is a 7 8 of an inch diameter white side router bit that bits and bits does an astro coating on. I absolutely love this bit. It has a bearing on top and bottom and both bearings are removable. And there are certain situations where you want to remove one bearing or the other. So this bit has bailed me out a couple times. This is a big compression bit, but if you look behind the serration, the, the, the cutting edges, if you look behind the cutting edges, you'll see a few little relief cuts and those relief cuts aren't that deep. So if you try your best to just plow through this bit, just really be aggressive with your cut, you can't be crazy aggressive because those little relief cuts behind the bit, they physically won't, or I'm sorry, behind the cutting edges, they physically won't allow you to take a super aggressive cut. And I think that's one of the most overlooked features of this exact bit that I don't hear anybody talking about. The geometry of this bit prevents you from getting too crazy and too out of hand. That's just my own personal experience speaking on that one. I really, really, really love this particular bit. Anyway, I do also have some straight bits that have bearings on them as well. And the only reason I bought these over the years is for where you want, for, for a very specific purpose where I needed the bearing to be towards the center of the, the uh, actual router bit. And it's just for mortising flat bottom stuff is the only way I'd use these. So not incredibly all around super duper useful. As a matter of fact, I always uh, try to get a spiral or try to use a spiral spiral rather than a straight bit. I'm getting so tongue tied with this video. 
<laughs> so anyway, I think that's everything as far as hitting the main topics. Uh, just briefly, hopefully you opened your eyes, give you a little bit of explanation to uh, the different geometry as far as flesh trim spirals. Uh, I have several spirals and bits and bits sent me a couple to make this video, uh, for helping make this video. So I'm going to put together a couple of these that I don't think I would utilize to the best of my workflow, I guess, and I'm going to give them away. So if you go to my website and leave a comment on my website, uh, I'll tally up the number of comments. They're, they are in numerical order of when they came in, and I'll use a random generator to determine what comment gets it, and I'll ship them to you. So. Uh, thanks to Bits and Bits for supporting this channel over the past couple years. Very, very much appreciate it. They make really high quality stuff, offer their bits at uh, competitive price or with competitive pricing. So if you're interested in, in a new router bit, go to bitsbits.com. Uh, use my code JBates at checkout to save uh, 10%. That's not an affiliate link. That is just simply the greatest coupon I could pass on to all of you. I make absolutely nothing on the volume of their sales. I'm not a salesman for them. Um, so yeah, I think I covered all the bases here. You guys take care, have a great day, and I'll catch you in the next video.